Christina. Thank you for everyone. Uh, it's exciting to be here. Let's hope that we all gain something from it. I just want to talk about um, Alex is the beginning of his journey and his the good, the bad and the ugly was what I was asked to talk about. So if there's anything that actually bothers you about what I say, um, that's the ugly bit. I might use words like diligent, wonderful, amazing and stressful a few times, but that's what the story's about. Um, when Alex was six years old, he became... We might go to the next one. Alex became a, uh, a boarder at Blue Mountains Grammar. His parents put him on the train at six years old and sent him with the master to Blue Mountains Grammar. He was an only child. His parents were working in those days. That was unusual, both parents working. But he went to Blue Mountains Grammar. On that day, he learned that some of the important things, he began to learn the important things that helped him through his life and that helped him in his later moments of life. Um, when he got to Blue Mountains Grammar, he discovered he had lots of friends. He went and enjoyed the, the wonderful forests on his bikes, bike with his friends. He had friends. He learned the value of friendship. Being an only child, he didn't have a big family, so friendship was important to him. Um, when he was seven, he was actually in charge of changing the beds of the children who'd wet the beds the night before. A big thing when you're seven. He learned compassion. Uh, during his, the next little diligent, very exciting happening when he was eight, they had a huge Blue Mountains fire. Now the bushfires roared down towards their school. The children were all taken down to the oval, placed under a tarpaulin, hosed down with the masters underneath the tarpaulin with them singing hymns. Alex learnt then the value of having God near him and for the comfort and the strength that he was given. He learnt to, he did music, he learnt to play the piano, started to learn to play the piano. He also learnt the tenor horn. On Sundays they would go to school by the march of, the, by the beat of the drum. Could you imagine all these little kids going to school by the beat of the drum in Blue Mountains Grammar? Then he learnt, through that I guess he learnt that that was, that was diligence. Early mornings in the Blue Mountains in East, at, when it was very cold through winter, they picked daffodils to sell. They had to go, get up early in the morning, all of the boarders, to sell, and the PNF sold them beside the road to, sh to make money for the school. In these days, it's a huge school, but in those days, it was very small. But he learnt duty. So I think that we find that these things set him up for his life. As firstly a GP, he gained a Commonwealth scholarship because he left um, Blue Mountains Grammar and he went to sixth class then and he went to Trinity Grammar. He gained a scholarship, a Commonwealth scholarship to go to University Sydney and became a GP. In his GP life, he saw no one with MND. And many GPs would say that. I think now, because the incidence has grown, it is, there's more, there's so much more. But he didn't see anyone. But we had a good friend, a very close friend, whose daughter-in-law, young mum, was diagnosed with, with motor neurone in 2010. In 2011, after her funeral, he noticed that his hand was wasting. He noticed he couldn't play the guitar he, as well. He gave up the guitar quite soon after that. He found it difficult to play the piano. So those symptoms, he had to search then for an answer. He looked, he knew the ropes. We, knew, we had moved to Tamworth after working in Wollongong for quite a while and being at Wollongong Hospital, we moved to Tamworth as, as a rural GP. So he knew the people, he knew who to see, but we couldn't find, because it was such a difficult disease, it was difficult to diagnose. But we ended up with Professor Dominic Rowe and when we got there, Dominic went through all the tests, you know, very thorough, and said, three doctors have told you you've got MND. Now I'm telling you, you have MND. It was interesting, though, because at that moment, they, MND, the multidisciplinary disciplinary clinic, took possession of the disease. We had a very different experience to Paul. Um, they looked after, the, Sandra who was in charge then of that clinic was amazing. We had, we were referred immediately to MND New South Wales. 
We also were given taxi vouchers. Everything happened on that day. So it was something that we learned to rely on and we knew that they were there. And most importantly, MND New South Wales. We found that um, they were so helpful. The meetings we went to, I went to the carer training. I'm an adult educator. I know how to learn and I know how that it's important that adults only learn the things they need to. No one would have done this, only you needed to. And I gained so much from that training. Um, we, I came from Tamworth. Uh, it was a big trip. One day we, I actually flew down with the help of MND New South Wales to do that. And it was important though to do that training. They set me up for knowing what was ahead. It was a disease that we weren't familiar with, only having known people who had it. I'd even helped look after a, a teacher, a fellow teacher who had it. But there's nothing like living through a disease to know, and especially this one, to know what you don't know. And MND New South Wales, that carer training was amazing. The Living Well with MND, it widened all our horizons. The local group meetings were really interesting. We seems macabre that you would go to a meeting when half the people are going to be dead maybe next year. But we helped each other. I found this amazing thing that you could buy wine bottle straws that long that you'd drink the bottle of wine. Not that we did this, <laughs> but it was helpful because Alex could drink no handed because he couldn't use his hands. And those wine bottle straws were useful for quite a while until he couldn't really Never did we drink a bottle of wine. Well, I'm telling you that anyway. So they were helpful. But we also found that in that very first day, one of the guys there was the father of one of our sons, sons friends from school. And one of the, one of the ladies that we, who'd just been diagnosed, she was the mother of one of our daughter's friends. So there we were in a community, a, you know, not a very large community, but knowing that these people were there and it was really important to us to, to have friendship and to meet up with them. The Flexi, Li, Li, uh, Flexi Quip were amazing. The first thing that came was the shower chair which was so helpful because it continue, Alex was able to continue his independence for a while. He could shower himself for a while but it continued to be MND New South Wales were there. We found that we had to move from Newcastle, from Tamworth. I didn't want to move. I'd been there 40 years. I had friends. I had my work. Our house was perfect. Um, our medical work network was so important to us, but it was so far away from Sydney. It was away from Dominic, which we felt was an important place to be, and MND, the, the group that I really continued to enjoy being part of. But Alex felt we had to do it. I did it under sufferance. Our family helped, everyone helped. Our network of friends were amazing. No one wanted us to leave, but we had to do this. And it happened. I cried for the first year. We came to Newcastle every day. Every day I cried. I missed so many people and so many, but TAFE had actually been giving me, paying my sick leave out in carer's leave and decided that they should give me a redundancy because I was had lots more sick leave. It was going to be a win. So we helped, we bought a house in Newcastle with our son, uh, contributed to a house, and his wife. Now they only, we have four children, they only had, they had no children, they'd been married 10 years. And it really looked unlikely that they would have any children. So our daughter in Sydney at Bondi, we weren't moving in with te four teenagers, I can tell you. Uh, and I'm really pleased we did. Uh, then later on they actually moved from Bondi to Newcastle so that was very helpful to have them and such wonderful help as they were. Um, our son from Brisbane could fly to Newcastle easily and we needed that help and that was helpful. Uh, he flew for two years every or sometimes drove he and his family came for two years every holidays every long weekend and Phil came quite a few weekends and caught the 5.30 a.m. flight back on Monday morning to start work. But we were able to bring with us the good things that we had. Um, Alex's piano, you can see, is being pulled apart. Uh, he didn't ever play it once we got to Newcastle. He couldn't. But all our family play and our daughter-in-law, uh, who we lived with, uh, her degree was in piano. So that was wonderful that we were able to do that. But we came to the beach. We came, our family in Sydney were close to us. That was good. And we were close to 
this strange new community that we didn't know very well. Our son had gone to university there, but we didn't have a network of medical professionals that we had so much. But we found that it was important to get, we were referred to people. We were, every person who offered to help, I accepted their help. Since Alex passed away, everyone who asked me to go somewhere, I went, and I do. But then everyone who offered. We had an OT, the original OT was from the community OT. Alex was not on NDIS because he was diagnosed after 65. He was 65, so he was on the aged care system. But we had a problem. We bought the house because it was so suitable for us. At this stage, you can see the original ramp that had been set up by the grandma who lived there beforehand. It was great for Alex while he could walk, but the OT could see that he needed a change. He needed to be able to... And it was great, this preparation that I'd already learned with our carer training, that we had to be prepared for that day that we would need that. Now, they wanted us to have the $35,000 electric ramp at the front of our son's house. They also, the other alternative would have been, and this was a very diligent person who knew the rules and who was very careful and caring. We, it wasn't a very wide block, so we would have had to have a ramp across back and across the front to have a ramp. All of the 100-year-old camellias would go. The whole thing was going to change. I knew Alex at that stage would probably have a year to live. He did live two years. So I had this plan that that crepe myrtle, you can see the stump there, why anyone built it there, put it there in the first place, um, would go and that we could put a ramp. We had a builder who came and he built that ramp. Now I know it wasn't legal, it was, and, but the biggest problem we found there was that our OT was fixated on this happening. Nothing else was going to happen except that ramp. And that made me, every time I heard she was coming, I was so stressed. I was, I said, tell her, tell her I can't come, I can't be there. But we eventually, a builder from our church, built that ramp and it worked amazingly, even though it was not legal. So that was the bad. But it worked and now our son's there in this house that doesn't have a $35,000 electric ramp that wouldn't have been suitable for them. Um, we had a, a NRA, the NRMA fix wheelchairs. I don't know whether everyone knows that, but they fix wheelchair tyres. They come, but you have to have the tube, and we didn't know that. And we thought, well, we had a tube, but it wasn't the right one. It was difficult. He came, and he wouldn't, once he got the tyre off with a lot of difficulty, he then, when the tube that we had didn't fit, he said, well, you can't do it. And our friend there, Peter, who was one of our helpful carers and great friends, he said, well, you could mend it. He said, oh, no, NRMA do not patch tyres, tubes. NRMA do not patch tubes. This is a wheelchair. Alex couldn't have gone anywhere for a week. Uh, we couldn't. He, we had him sitting on a lounge while they did it. But we, he, we showed him how to mend a tube. <laughs> that guy there, Peter, showed him how you mend a tube. He learned something that day. We found also that wheelchairs don't go through beautiful $6,000 rugs in the lounge room. Um, that was difficult. Uh, I had to get Alex and I was terrified that our daughter-in-law would come home and see her rug in mangled pieces. But summoned the man next door, he got it out. Now I was a fashion teacher originally until I retrained. I taught fashion with my friend Robin here. We trained early, uh, way back together. I learnt to use the skills I had and I reckon that came from really the fact that we needed to do that and I needed to but I learnt from the carers group you use the skills you've got and I did. I, Mr Velcro was the best inventor in history. I can put flies in pyjamas, flies in tracksuits. It made it so much easier to dress Alex, so much easier. Um, I created every size, shape and cushion. I put fitted sheets, plastic on the, uh, not plastic, satin on the sheets because of course they helped and I learnt that in MND at my training and that worked but I still sewed my wedding creations. In the house that we were able to buy our, we had our own little lounge room and there was a door off to this wonderful room which was my sewing room so I could leave. We were right next door to each other. I looked after Alex all the time. I needed to have, we had our carers because we actually went through the um, mandatory assessment for uh, aged care assessment team came. We had it done in Tamworth. 
The bother was that we had to have it done again when we went to Newcastle. It's still the same system, Hunter New England, but there you are. Um, we had to have it done. We had to wait weeks and that was a problem because we needed someone to help. We eventually had carers one and a half hours each morning except for Sunday when we had a friend come and help us because we couldn't rely on them enough for us to get to church in time. Um, Ham and Care were our carers and they were amazing. They were really wonderful people. Once Alex weirded out the people that suited him, we ended up with three people and he was the one who chose who would help. And those people were so caring and so wonderful. Uh, they asked him, even though I would say, no, I think we should know, we checked. And Alex, they respected him and they valued his expertise and how he wanted to be dressed, etc. We learnt those things. Um, training difficulties, we had a difficulty. We got a wonderful, the lifter, which we needed and I knew that we would need. We practised, even Stuart had been in it in our training in Sydney. Um, but we had to have a trainer who was, uh, because we were under aged care, we had to have a trainer, a private trainer. We had been at that stage uh, with the hospice. The hospice had been helping us and had, we'd had the most amazing OT there, but she wasn't allowed to train us, even though she'd showed us in the hospice how to work. So the problem was this lady didn't know how to use the machine. So Alex was injured a bit there. Hospitals were difficult. Um, that the nice button didn't work at Belmont Hospital because they didn't have one. But our boys there were very helpful and we found that um, it was difficult because he was the chest patient. That was all. We couldn't see um, a neurologist, only a chest, he was the chest patient. Um, as you can see, one doctor said to us, if you stop talking, you won't be choking. That was in the middle of the night, that was difficult. John Hunter, you can't get into the toilets with a wheelchair. Um, we moved then to John Hunter MND Clinic, which was in its infancy, but it was wonderful. The important thing, the difficulties Alex always had was his bowels and his breath. We had difficulty with that. I was the only one who could use uh, an enema of any sort or a suppository because our carers aren't trained to do that. We could have a nurse one hour a week. Alex needed it every day. But a good, reliable set of bowels is worth more to any man than a quanti any quantity of brains. You will remember that in your age. <laughs> Our speech therapy therapist was amazing. He was great and he, was, he learned, he knew when to refer Alex to someone who was the amazing Grace, who showed Alex how to use that. We were originally told that Alex, with his type of MND, he would not lose his voice. He did, but that eye gaze was amazing. Simon Ashley, a chiropractor who was our, our son's friend, came. He came every day for one hour and helped every week for one hour to make Alex comfortable. We bought the vehicle at Toyota Noah because I'd done a lot of research. It was an amazing, amazing vehicle. We could go places, we'd go to church. It would back up to anywhere, even the steps. That's my son-in-law down there. Everyone needs a Matthew. He's tall, he's strong. He doesn't do very, I'm going to be a little bit longer. Uh, he doesn't do bodily <laughs> fluids very easily though. We were able to go everywhere to um, M&D Ball, we went to Barrel to a wedding, went to my dad's 95th birthday. The peg journey was difficult because uh, they weren't set up for an M&D patient. They had to go and find a lifter, they had to find all the gear, then they ended up trying to lift the um, chair as well. Uh, Alex ended up in intensive care. But it meant, I'd been given instruction, you'll be able to blend everything up. I went straight to the resource boxes every day. I needed to be with Alex. I also went to the Picatin. Picatin, that's my, our grandson, our, two, our son and his wife had a baby after 11 years, and that's him. Oh, now I'll cry, but I'm not going to. He, I was doing that little picture the other day and he took away, ate the apple off my, but it's so good to go to the cupboard, get a can of baked beans, an egg and a toast, and we have lunch. The home medicine review was very good too with our amazing um, pig that Alex used. We went to the Mercy Hospital for the hospice. They were amazing. They took Alex every Thursday from 10, you know, 30 to 2 p.m. and they looked after him while I could just go and do things. Networks are amazing. One needs networks, family, church, community, the medical community fraternity we built up. Um, our 
my goddaughter there, Robin's daughter's there, shaving. The judge is fit changing our lights, our local judge who came and sat with Alex. You know, he had a ladder, he came and it was very helpful. Um, our friend, Polish friend on the right shaving Alex, he used to get Alex ready for church every Sunday morning. Otto grew, we had family come, it was a house we could have for everyone. Our last outing with Alex was appropriately to church because God meant a lot of, to us. We prayed a lot. We relied on God so much. Amazingly, our son on the right was over from America, from Colorado, uh, who lives there, and he, they sang in church that Sunday. But John Atty, a professor of medicine at Newcastle, said, Alex, you need to go to the hospice. You need to go now. So he went. It was difficult. We found that it was a very hard. John came around to her house on Sunday afternoon and said, you need to go, you need, it is end of life, I need to talk to you about. We'd used the cough machine, the cough assist, which was amazing. He, were, he had used um, amazing help we had from our, from Nick, from the multidisciplinary clinic in helping Alex breathe, but his breathing, it was just too difficult. Um, we had, it was a familiar environment because Alex had been going there every Thursday for over a year. We went down the same corridor. I took Alex in his wheelchair. They were going to take him in an ambulance and I said, no, we need to do what we set out to do originally. We went in the wheelchair and felt comfortable going up that corridor. Every day, all the time, we had music. Our son flew down from Brisbane. Everyone was there with us, our daughter, our, Brisbane, our Newcastle son. The eye gaze made a difference. Philip, our eldest boy, was able to help move Alex and change him, help him to do the things he needed to do. They were all there in the, that last week. The difficulty for us, though, was we, didn't, we weren't familiar with the, with the doctor who came, the doctor who was there. We didn't know. We'd set up Alex's end-of-life program and plan with Dominic, but Alex couldn't. It was a bridge too far to go to Macquarie. So we went there. The day Alex went in, the doctor stood at the foot of his bed and said, you realise we only take people here for two weeks. And after two weeks, we'll move you on. I was horrified. We've been told, you know, three days and you will be, that will be it. We were not ready for a doctor who didn't know us and didn't understand. The staff were amazing, absolutely amazing. And they cared so much. But this last night came, the last day, and we couldn't, the doctor would not come. We had to go, my son pleaded, please come. Alex was having so many terrible episodes. We really were prepared to be having whatever, the morphine pump, that's what we'd planned. But he said he's not having enough episodes, he is not sick enough. It took an hour nearly to get the medication. When you're in hospital, in a hospice, obviously they're busy, the nurses have to, you have to ring for a nurse, the nurse comes, a caring, wonderful nurse, she has to find someone else, they have to approve, they have to find the, the key, open the cupboard, and sometimes it took an hour, and Alex was in such distress and unable to breathe. This was difficult. The doctor left that afternoon at 4.30, the nurses said, you will have a long night. At, at 9.30, Alex passed away, and it was... We rejoiced, it, we rejoiced because he was so sick. Afterwards, of course, I felt so devastated, and I still do. After being married for nearly 49 years, it's really difficult, and there were many things that happened along the way. But this book by Jerry Sitzer, I've been, was given as part of a, you know, people give you books when someone's died. You mightn't have had this happen, but lots of them are very good. But this is my catchphrase for the moment. It was a very bad chapter in a very good book. Thank you.